Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to the Mortgage Lab uh, live stream. Today, we are interviewing, uh, we're having a chat with Ed McKnight and Andrew Nickel uh, from Opus Partners. They also run the top business podcast in New Zealand, uh, Property Academy Podcast. Now, I'm excited about this interview because it's rare that I find someone so uh, into spreadsheets as much as I am, and Ed is that person. So we can nerd out for as long as we like because no one can stop the stream until uh, I do. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, <laughs> some, some details. Uh, so let's talk about um, COVID-19, lockdown level four, and the rental property market. What sort of impact have you seen on the rental property market? as it today so um so i've been talking to linda uh, uh who runs our property management company so we've got a subsidiary company to opus called venture management uh we plug here and uh they they manage about 500 properties across new zealand and um i, I had a chat to her yesterday uh, just about the tenants and what what, what people's payments have been like. So far, uh, the vast majority of our tenants are just continuing to pay rent as as um, as they would normally, um, which is, is required by law that they still have to pay their rent. Having said that, there have been about 14 uh, instances where people have asked for some rent relief or, um, or can't pay their rent payments at the moment because of some changes in income uh, situations. Um, of those 14 or uh, 15 people, um, a few of them are delinquents on their rent uh, anyway, and so they've been sued with 20, 21 day notices um, recently. So, so it's it's no surprise that they may be using this uh, s the situation to try and get some further rent relief. Um, uh, but our, our, our emo is pretty much the same as normal. If you don't pay your rent, then then we have to follow due process. Having said that, really important that landlords are kind in, in a situation like this. One of my clients, long client, uh, a long-term client of mine contacted me just the other day because their tenant has contacted them through their property manager um, saying that they can't afford any of their rent. And funnily enough, they themselves own a rental property and have um, given given their tenants free rent for three months. And so they expected that to, be, to, to happen. Now, yeah. Um, yeah, my clients um, are not in a position to be able to do that. Um, so I, I told them to make that clear to, to the tenants via their property manager, um, at, but to offer a few different solutions. So one of the solutions that I offered was a $20 decrease in rent for, for three months, which they can absolutely afford to do, and they would happy, happily accept that and not look to recoup that later. My second solution was to offer them a more significant reduction in rent uh, by about half and then to capitalise the the payments that they, they ought to have been making over the remainder nine months of the lease to once we come out of um, isolation and everyone returns back to work uh, so that they still receive the same amount of money. And one of our one of our strategies at Opus is to make sure people have a rental buffer account to allow for such things. So they'll pay a little bit of interest on that. It works out to be under $50 a week, uh, sorry, $50 in total if that money is repaid over the nine month period. So it's insignificant. They'll, they'll wear that cost, the, my clients will wear that cost um, in order to help these people out. Um, the third and final scenario, which is a worst case scenario, is to give the clients, uh, give the tenants, um, sorry, a, a um, complete uh, rent holiday for a few months. Now, this I advised as doing as a last resort. Um, in this instance, the client, that my clients will need to either use their rental account to absorb the losses, or they'll need to apply for a mortgage holiday for a few months. Um, if if this were my tenants, I would probably be looking for new tenants outside of COVID nineteen because um, it might be much harder to recoup that money over over the remainder term of the lease. Um, and it's and it's best that we all agree to part ways as friends. Uh, and, and and take that money out of the bond potentially or agree to take that money out of the bond assuming there's no damage to the property or have a payment plan afterwards but have them go and find a cheaper property that they can afford and then find a new tenant uh, to replace them. Uh, now I do think that it's really important as I said before to be decent in a situation like this because no one expected it. It's not anyone's fault. Um, but we are still running a business, and it's really important that you you're aware of uh, implications of things like a mortgage holiday, which is not the holiday that it sounds. It's the holiday that you're going to have to pay and pay some more on that because of the fact that you've got capitalised interest. And um, so it's just important. Unfortunately, what's happened is. 
the media have put out all of this information uh, about mortgage holidays and people uh, who are tenants who may not have a mortgage don't understand the negative impact of a mortgage holiday and so um, we're, we're making sure that we, we let our tenants know that we're there for them um, but uh, we do need to we do need, still need to meet our obligations um, shelter is a right but it has the responsibility of, of being paid for I think I've lost someone's sound either that or uh, Rupert's just um, mouthing words to me I can't hear Rupert either, so I'll take I'll take oh. over for the stream while he figures oh, right. he figures okay, it out. So I'm right, now I'm right. now the host because Rupert can't hear any of us. <laughs> so Rupert, get your sound quickly because you don't know what I'm going to say now. Andrew, uh, now what I want to talk to you about is look in this new environment. Are you going to aim for any new properties you bring on? Are you going to be aiming for capital growth or some cash flow? Because obviously cash flow is king at the moment. Everybody's wanting cash flow, but are you going to be gearing up if you buy a new property for something that's capital gear? Uh, Sorry, capital growth geared or cash flow geared? That, that, um, that's a good question, but I guess that comes down to as case by case, depending on the client. Um, there is going to be some... So I think once you develop a plan, you're always going to have blips along the way. And so it's really important that you still stay the course. And so uh, as Jacinda's going to do with her four-week plan of isolation, it's important that a single uh, event doesn't make you deviate from your plan. So um, that probably goes for people that maybe have a property at the moment who they're, they're about to suffer some vacancy perhaps or they're about to suffer some lost rents perhaps. That could be an automatic um, uh, that could make people panic and then sell their property when we come out of isolation thinking, oh, that didn't work and this is all a bit scary now. So um, the same to said for your plan. If your plan is to develop enough equity uh, in 20 years to, to retire, for example, then you need to be looking for capital growth properties. And the great news is um, you can buy a good growth property now without having to make much in the way of a contribution, if anything at all, because the interest rates have come down so much. So, so, so much. Um, uh, you, you, I, I would always go growth over yield anyway if you're trying to build wealth. Um, if you're retired, then obviously that's that's about buying yield. Yes, yes, yes. Rupert, can you hear us yet? Yep, can but you we us? can't. We can't hear. You. No. So we're going to continue then. So the next thing we're going to talk about, <laughs> because this is the next question, um, was where would you look to buy an investment property and why? Now I'm going to share my screen in a minute, and we're going to go through some data, which is re it's it's really cool, guys. You're going to love this. Um, but I just want to talk about the logic behind this, right? Because we have property cycles, right, in New Zealand, and all of the regions are on different cycles. You know. Auckland could be uh, could be booming while Christchurch is in a slump. Similarly, uh, uh, Canterbury could be could be at a peak while while another suburb like Manawatu <coughs> Wanganui is going through a decline. So one of the things that we always think about is where are each regions within their property cycle, and we've got a graph or a, a model that we use to try and figure this out. I am, oh I don't I've got to download something in order to be able to uh, share my desktop just while I'm doing that. Um, I will just mention that I might one way we in. do that. <laughs> We've got Rupert back now. Yes. Oh, Rupert's back. That's great. Rupert, thank, thanks for being back. <laughs> <laughs> Some Bluetooth technology problems. That's all right. Um, yeah. So while while it's doing that, I'll just talk about some of the data that we've we've been looking at over the last week. While we did a webinar the other uh, last week or this week, sorry, uh, it's very confusing. Isolation as to what day it is. I, I saw I saw a meeting the other day just to uh, just to just to interject for a little bit, uh, which said there are only three days in lockdown: yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, and it's very very true. Um, uh, so in and I have been um, working tirelessly through Excel spreadsheets, um, which is which is a lot of fun for nerds, um, and we. We, we, we've been looking at um, the parts of New Zealand which are um, uh, under what the na what they were as a percentage of the national average previously. So, for example, if, if Auckland is 140% of what the national average is in, uh, if, on long-term average, then if we're now at 150 then you could consider that to be overvalued or over what the national average has been historically. That doesn't mean there's not going to be more growth, um, but 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 it's something to just consider. Um, and and we looked at um, all the regions of New Zealand, looked at the areas where we think the most opportunity is. Um, some of the areas that we've just spoken about, literally um, ten minutes ago when we were recording our podcast, um, are Auckland and Christchurch being 
or uh, Auckland kind of is at that at, at that level of the national average right now. And Christchurch uh, is significantly undervalued. So potentially there's some, some opportunity there. Ed, how are you going with that share screen? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Uh, Rupert, screen let, let me just uh, let me just share it properly. Uh, are you able to switch it over, Rupert? Yeah. Can you see that there? No, we can't see it yet. No, we've got a blank screen there. Oh, let me share it now. I know we go. that I'm going to share my entire screen with you. Can you see it now? Yep, we got it. Hang up. Give me two seconds. Here we go. No worries. But you, uh, you let me go. We go. Perfect. So the whole idea is that regions that are in their troughs, regions that are at the bottom of their investment cycle are more likely to go into their boom phase next than somewhere that's already peaking. So if you're already at your peak, your region's property prices, in terms of where it is in its property cycle, if it's about to go into a downturn naturally anyway, because that's where it is in its cycle, then you're gonna face a deeper uh, dip in property prices than someone who's at its trough, because there's already some pent up demand over here. Now, the big question is, how do you tell whether a region is, is at its peak or at its trough? And we use this graph which is really based around the idea of where is each region compared to its long-term average. So over the last 27 years, Northland has been on average 83%, 83% of the national median house price. And you can see there are areas where it was above that. This is where it is over overvalued, quote unquote, overvalued compared to its long-term average, this is where it was undervalued. So what you'd typically say is that if it was overvalued, that's the point where it's most likely to go into a bit of a trough. Um, when it is undervalued, that's where it's going to go through some boom time. And you can see in this graph here, just where I've matched the two up here, you can see that uh, when it was at uh, above its long-term value, when it was above that, it went through a period of uh, a flat period, a trough. When it was well below, when it was well below its long-term value, it went into a boom time. So the question is, where is Northland compared in this scenario? Where is it compared to its long-term average? Now let's just zoom in, and you can see it is slightly above its long-term average. So I would say, look, Northland's about where it should be. I wouldn't necessarily expect too much growth over that market. So I would expect that it's probably, let me just zoom out of here, it's probably around this section. It's probably going into a peak. So it may be hard to hit. So the next question is, if we look at all different 16 regions in New Zealand, which ones are underpriced? Which ones are here? They're well below their long-term average. And hey, I'm just going to quickly run through these for you. I've got all 16 graphs here. These are beautiful, aren't they, Rupert? Please, please confirm that. I love it. I love it. And all of this data can be got on the Opus Partners website, can it? Yeah, yep. we've actually made this all public. So um, this this was kind of this is part of our secret source, having a look at the different areas and figuring out where the opportunity next opportunity is. Uh, we've decided we want that to be public because um, anyone can access that, uh, and then and then if if they want any greater understanding of how to actually use that data, um, we, we can help them understand it. Um, otherwise, uh, they can just read through the um, many many pages of uh, Excel spreadsheets that we've put on there. So the next thing. Uh, so let's quickly whip through this, and then I've got something else that I want to share, which is really cool as well, Rupert. So uh, most underpriced re regions and overpriced regions in New Zealand compared to their long-term averages, Canterbury, 15% under, Marlborough, 6.2% under, Taranaki, oh, my hometown, 4.25% under its long-term, West Coast, oh, we're going to talk about this, Rupert, 30% under its long-term value. Uh, significantly uh, below, but we can talk about that because I've got some thoughts around this. Otago, 20% over its long-term value, very much so at its peak, most likely. Southland, almost 12%, 11.58%. Hawke's Bay, 782 and Bay of Plenty, 6.77%. So using this model, these are the regions, the blue ones are the ones that we think generally, apart from the West Coast, which we can talk about if you like, uh, are the ones that are probably going to do the best throughout the, uh, any economic downturn we go through because they're already at the stage where they're at the early stage of their booms or they're ready for some of that catch-up growth. Um, Southland, Otago, we, we, our belief is that they're near their peaks or they're already well through their existing property cycle, so they're ready to go into that, that either slight decline or flattening off of property prices over, over, over the next 
couple of years anyway. So those are the regions that we think there probably won't be much property price growth over the medium term. So this is this is some really cool data. I'm really proud of this. Hey, just one thing as well before we get on to the next question. You can see there are a lot of slides here. Um, not only have we released this on our website, we have suburb level data, and I'm just going to zoom in here. We have got the median suburb values of every suburb in New Zealand, all 800 or something like that suburbs, and we've released that over our web on our website like this. So this is all of suburbs in Monaco and how they have reacted over the last 20 years. So you can just go on our website, all completely free, and you can see how your suburb has fared or your investment property suburb has fared over the last 20 years. We believe that this is the most data that any property investment company has freely released uh, 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 anywhere on the internet at the moment in regards to the New Zealand property market. It's amazing, yeah. And so where would, the, where would people be looking in terms of um, uh, um, suburbs and things? What would, they, what would you generally be testing for? Would you go for the low-end suburbs or the high-end suburbs? Or? Oh, I've got so some data doing... for that as well. So we, um, <laughs> we, we typically recommend generally mid-priced suburbs. And the reason behind that is that when we look at the variation between um, dips, what, when you go for either really high-priced suburbs or really low-priced suburbs, what happens is some of them will have very small dips, but some of them might have very large dips. So you, it's a bit of a mixed bag. You don't necessarily know, are you going to get a small dip or are you going to get a really large dip? Bendleton, the most expensive suburb in Canterbury had a dip of about 13 to 14% during the last GFC. Um, whereas if you, and it's similar for really poor suburbs, you either get a little dip or you get really large dips. But the ones in the middle are all quite consistent. When I looked at Canterbury or Christchurch city suburbs uh, during the GFC, they were all between 4 to 8% dips. Whereas um, with the more expensive and, and cheaper suburbs, you either had very small dips uh, of maybe 3% or very large dips of about 13 14%. So generally, I like to go for, for the middle. I take out the bottom 20%. I take out the top 20%. And if you focus in the middle, you're generally okay. You'll get less variation there. You know what you're going to expect. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, and so do you guys look for mainly existing properties or new build? Where are you looking? Apartments, houses? What are you looking for? So we focus, generally speaking, on new because most of our clients want a uh, safer investment. And so safer often means that you uh, mitigate some of the risks with investing um, in property, which vacancy um, and maintenance are two of the major ones by buying a better quality investment. So that means you spend a little bit more to eliminate some of those costs later on. So generally speaking, a newer property is more sought after than an existing property because they're safer and warmer, drier. Um, and so that 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 really helps reduce your vacancy rate. Um, in terms of a newer property, you might spend $500 a year in, in maintenance compared to potentially significantly more with deferred maintenance. So we've done some modeling around that and someone that buys a, 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 an older property and then has to do some renovations to get it to a higher level to achieve a higher rent and then has to spend a bit of money um, uh, over, on over time over things like a roof or or, um, or replacing weatherboards all those kind of things the the cost is significantly more and the return on investment is significantly less couple that with the fact that LVR restrictions mean that you can still buy a new property with a 20% deposit compared to a 30% deposit for an existing property so if it's already built then it's it's a 30% deposit so um, all those things combined mean that we focus on newer properties. As for apartment, townhouse, um, house, that depends completely on the individual. So um, we've got options. Uh, if, a, if a client was looking for growth, generally speaking, they'd look for a house or a townhouse because they generally are going to sell to a uh, owner-occupier, who is going to push the price up compared to an investment type product, something like a room by room rental or a, 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 a say a dual key apartment. Dual key apartments though have their pl place in our business for people who are either retiring, they're more focused on yield, uh, they're either retiring or they're, um, they're in retirement now and they want to have better cash flow because that's what they're interested in, not the growth aspect of things anymore. Yeah. Same same old uh, same old rules with investment, eh? Horses for courses, whatever you're looking for, search out yep. for the best one for you. Don't don't go with what Joe Gloves next door does. No, just, Absolutely. Just, just, worst worst thing you can do is do what your neighbor's doing because his plan might be completely different to yours. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so um, if you, you've got someone who's uh, interested in buying investment property right now during the lockdown, what can they do uh, today? So what? So we, we've um, uh, behind me. There's a bunch of. Um, I, I'm basically working with a number of clients at the moment um, in lockdown to prepare themselves. So our advice to investors is not to invest today uh, because um, you're you're in a situation where you're unable to facilitate due diligence, which is which normally requires physical aspect to it. So doing a valuation, um, meeting with an accountant, often um, talking to a solicitor, doing a, uh, going and looking at the property or doing a site visit, looking at a comparable property property, meeting with a property manager. There's lots of aspects about due diligence that if you're going to do it in its fullest, um, you want to actually have a physical component to that. So our advice is to use this time to get prepared because there's going to be a lot of opportunities when we come out of isolation. So what my uh, what I'm telling my clients to do is um, get all the information now. So get, get a plan prepared. Um, figure out what the right property type and property area would be, would, would be to suit you. So um, we, we are giving clients um, a range of budgets on different properties in different areas, but not giving them the properties at this stage. Then what we're doing is we're making sure that clients are getting pre-approved, actually getting that approval from the bank so they know how what their limitations are there because that might determine which area they invest in because if, if their budget's 600,000, they're probably not going to be investing in Auckland. Um, and so then we can kind of um, combine those things and figure out what the right strategy will be coming out. Um, our clients um, who, who are kind of registering their interest now um, are going to get property options a few days out from, from lockdown being released or relaxed. And um, and then, then what we will suggest they do it after the lockdown ends is then they'll put a property on hold formally and do due diligence over a number of weeks to make sure that it is the right property for their model and that all their professionals, their accountant, their lawyer all sign off on it. Um, but again, we're, re we're recommending that you get prepared and ready to take advantage of the good opportunities, but you don't do the next phase until we have a uh, level three or level two, probably more desirably. Yeah, that's right. That, so the answer I was looking for was actually talk to Mortgage Lab. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> so you're spot on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and so finally, what do you see um, going ahead um, for the insurer for the investment property market? So obviously, investment property is a long term thing. So, uh, but but as soon as we come off level two, what do you what do you think is going to happen? Is there going to be a rush to to buy or? So Ed and I actually covered this on one of our podcasts recently. So um, uh, so my predictions, and it does depend a little bit on how long um, the different levels last um, because that might push things out and take, things might take longer to, to happen. But um, my expectation, if we, if we uh, and, and based on the numbers so far, it looks fairly promising that we will return to a level three um, at the four week mark as, as originally kind of outlined by Jacinda. Um, I, I, I do think that what we will have is that there will be a, a an initial phase where people will just be finding their feet again, um, going back to work, getting a haircut, um, actually getting back into the routine of normal life. Um, and that will probably stop people making a, a, a uh, investment decision at that stage that's the time that we we're recommending our clients get in because that's when you get the best deals because i guarantee you um once that initial phase is over and people are back into a routine the market will have some real some heat in it in certain areas because interest rates are at an unprecedented low area uh, uh, rates at the moment you can get an interest rate for a year at kind of around three percent so it, it is very very cheap um, in terms of your interest cost of owning a property so there will be people take advantage of that and you want to be able to strike while the iron's hot because um, our, our three steps I can't remember exactly what they, they were, were mum, they, they, the they first were. one was mum so the quiet period it's going to be a mum period where it's very quiet which is now then we're going to uh, and and just as we first get out but then the market will still to build, start to build momentum. We'll start to get momentum as people get into the property market because of these low interest rates. Uh, and then finally, we think we're going to get to a period where it's just going to go mental. So that's, uh, that, those are the three M's. Mum, momentum, mental. But the trick is you don't want to get into the market when it's mental because you've already lost it. Once property prices yes. start going up, you've missed the boat. Yeah. It's already if, it's, yeah, if the market's already booming, you've lost it. Somebody else has made those gains. 
and our thoughts are that in the in the first month or two months again depending on how long different stages um last that will uh, the first month or two months that's going to be that that um momentum phase um after that i think it's really going to have some heat in it and, and again the disclaimer that goes with that is it does depend how long things last our, our website so we've just had a question around the website and accessing the data our website is um www dot opezpartners.co.nz and opez is spelled o-p-e-s partners with an s at the end dot co.nz and then if you go to the um where to invest it's got all the different cities and regions there oh andrew you're such an old man you saying www <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm just gonna you sound like my grandfather he always used to say don't say dub 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 isn't a letter it's www hey i'm just going to reply to in the comments as well uh cool. richard with as well as uh if you're keen as well to come to our webinar which is about the rental market get this coming tuesday i'm going to drop that link into the uh comment section as well is there a video of the previous week's webinar? Because um, that was kind of quite an yes. in-depth um, look at that data. 165,000 data points, which was um, super impressive. Uh, and you go quite deep into that data during that hour. So um, there's a video. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's actually a link on our website. Ed, what, uh, do you want to link that, uh, that uh, drop that link in as well? Um, so I certainly can. WWW is again. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you want to go back. Even, we've, had, we've had clients who have gone back and watched that again already because um, probably in half speed so that they can actually uh, listen hear what Ed's saying about those, um, about those exciting areas. But yeah, um, really, really good content. Um, we're really pleased with how that was received. And um, uh, again, it's all, uh, it's all available for free on our website brilliant all right and let's wrap it up there guys but um uh you can go to the opus partners website and register for the webinar that's coming up on tuesday at 7 p.m uh subscribe to the property academy podcast on apple or your favorite uh, podcast channel um if you want to watch more of these videos from the mortgage lab you can subscribe to our youtube channel just search for the mortgage lab uh, or you can like our facebook page and you'll get a notification when we go live to watch more of these interviews. So thanks for coming on today, guys. Uh, really, really good to have you. A pleasure. Thanks for having us.